Welcome to a conversation on international affairs. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is the Right Honorable Chris Patton, who is a member of the British Parliament from Bath. He has just been named Secretary of State for the Environment. Previously, he was Minister for Overseas Development. He is the author of a book entitled The Tory Case. He was educated at Oxford. Chris, welcome to Berkeley. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, at Oxford, what did your studies emphasize? I studied history at Oxford, but I spent uh, a considerable amount of my time editing magazines, acting, playing a lot of cricket, <laughs> and uh, not doing very much politics. And what got you into politics, actually? America. America. I came here um, as a, on a traveling scholarship after university. And uh, while I was over here, got involved in the John Lindsay mayoral campaign in 1965, <laughs> back in the uh, Middle Ages. Uh, and uh, I'd been supposed to be joining the British Broad Broadcasting Corporation as a graduate trainee after Oxford. Um, but I had a few months to kill, and having worked on an American campaign and got the bug, uh, I went back to Britain and got involved in politics there. And said no to the BBC, which they regarded as Les Majesté, but nevertheless it set me out on a political career. And uh, you ran for Parliament, I think, in, in 74? I or? didn't. I didn't. I ran for Parliament in 1974. Um, before that, I'd had a spell in the Cabinet Office uh, and the Home Office, which is our Interior Ministry. Um, I had a couple of years as Lord Carrington's political secretary when he was uh, Defence Secretary of State and Chairman of the Conservative Party. Uh, and I ran for Parliament for the first time in February 74 during the um, election which really turned on the miners' dispute. Um, I stood in a pretty hopeless uh, seat, a strong Labour seat in South London. Then after that election I had five years as Director of the Conservative Party's Research Department um, at the end of Ted Heath's period as leader and then for Margaret Thatcher's period. Uh, and then I stood for Parliament for Bath in 1979, and I've been in Parliament now 10 years. 10 years. And what is the, the nature of the district that you now have? I've got um, uh, the city of Bath, very hardly any countryside, almost an entirely urban seat. Um, it's a fairly small constituency in UK terms, about uh, 85, 86,000, something like that in terms of population. Um, it's uh, a very beautiful 18th century city, uh, university, big hospital, um, biggest employer is the Ministry of Defence. Uh, so a wide range of public sector activities and then it's a very attractive focus for tourists. There's a big um, tourist industry and I think and hope that American tourists will continue to go to Bath in very large numbers, particularly after seeing this conversation. <laughs> Uh, w w w as you entered politics and, and, and you've, you've had this career, uh, what sorts of things have you learned by being an MP that, that you really never got out of books? Or, or did your education contribute at all to your political career? I don't think my education contributed very much to my political career, um, except that um, I learned to write at university. And I think um, that has been a considerable help along the way. I've spent um, a good deal of my time um, employed as a political draftsman, either writing speeches in the past um, or writing manifestos and pamphlets more recently. Um, it's um, uh, not the most elevated trade, but it requires a certain uh, facility with words. And I think I learned that at uh, university. I also did when I was a backbench MP before I became a minister quite a lot of journalism so I uh, th that uh, was, an, was a help too. I think that um, what most surprises anybody who goes into politics from even a modestly cerebral background um, is the uh, vulgarity of much of the cut and thrust of politics. Um, I think one is constantly surprised by um, how middle or lowbrow one often has to be in order to be effective. Um, that's, I think, more a comment on politicians than on the public, because I rather share Adley Stevenson's view that the average man is probably a great deal better than the average. 
Uh, you've mentioned that you worked in the Lindsay campaign or observed it one or the other, and you've just quoted Stevenson. Why did you enter the Tory party? I would have probably voted Labour if I'd had the vote um, in 1964, which was at the end of 13 period years of, uh, uh, of conservative government. I'd read at university um, some of the works of Tony Crossland, who was the main socialist revisionist intellectual, um, and wrote um, an extremely effective book on social democracy. But it didn't take very long of a Labour government to um, uh, drain my um, persona of uh, such social democratic uh, sympathies as it might otherwise have had. <laughs> um, Harold Wilson put quite a lot of people like me to the sword, or, or at least put our aspirations to the sword very rapidly. And I guess I became a Tory because I believe in balance, because I'm rather skeptical about um, people who think they've got all embracing solutions, uh, because I believe in the market economy, um, because I believe in trying to get a balance between uh, individual freedom on the one hand and social responsibility on the other. And historically, the Conservative Party, um, unlike perhaps quite a lot of continental Conservative parties, and unlike also perhaps Conservatives in the United States, um, has established a bridge between those two different things, individual responsibility and uh, individual freedom and social responsibility. In, in the Conservative Party, you have been considered what is called a wet. Explain mm. what that means. Well, it's, um, I guess the derivation is uh, school boy, school girl abuse. Um, people who, weren't, uh, who aren't gung-ho in the playground for climbing over the barbed wire or um, uh, going through the door marked beware high voltage uh, are very often uh, called wet, which suggests certain wimpishness. And some on the, at the moderate, rather traditional end of the Conservative Party um, were called wet by people further to the right um, for expressing concerns, for example, in the early 1980s about the rise in unemployment or about some of the other doubtless inevitable uh, effects of the measures we had to take in order to abate inflation and change the balance between trade unions and the rest of society. Now, you, in, in your career in, in the party, were, act, were a, you were a speechwriter for, for Margaret Thatcher, I, I gather. Uh, so what sorts of uh, uh, tension did that pose with your coming from the wet side of the party? It was a, a mutual learning process. Well, the Conservative Party is a broad church rather than a narrow um, sectarian clack. Uh, and I think Mrs. Thatcher has uh, always recognized that, both in those that she's appointed to jobs and in those on whom she's drawn for ideas herself. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'd first been appointed as director of the Conservative Research Department when Ted Heath was leader of the Conservative Party. I was retained in that job by Margaret Thatcher, and I suppose it was in the period from 75 to 79 that I worked most closely with her on speeches and so on. And I've done a bit of work more recently as well. Now, uh, your most recent job was as uh, Secretary for Overseas Development. Explain uh, what was involved in that role. Yeah. Um, our Foreign Office is divided into two wings, the diplomatic wing and the aid wing. And I was the minister responsible to our Foreign Secretary for the um, Overseas Development aid wing. Um, I had a, a, a small um, semi-independent department um, employing 14, 1,500 people, including a very good scientific unit. Um, we had a budget of about one and a half billion pounds, where the fifth or sixth largest aid donor in the world. Uh, and we covered both the uh, multilateral contributions made by Britain for aid purposes, contributions to the Bretton Woods institutions, the regional development banks, the European community, the UN agencies. Uh, and we also 
covered the 60% of our program which goes on bilateral assistance to sub-Saharan Africa, southern, southern Asia, um, the Caribbean in, in the main, plus um, smaller programs elsewhere. So it was a, a fascinating job. Um, I, my, my Canadian colleague, Maggie Catley Carlson, who's been the president of the Canadian Development Agency for some time, used to say that on a bad day she thought she had the best job in Canada. On a good day she thought she had the best job in the world. Uh, and that was very much my own feeling too. It was a marvellously interesting job, though it could be a pretty harrowing one as well. And it was a small department relative to the one you've now taken over. Yes, it was. Um, it, uh, uh, it, it was pretty small, small enough to, for one to become very familiar with at least the um, senior and middle ranking officials in the department and small enough to produce uh, a, a real sense of team spirit, I think. Um, it was a, it's a very effective department, um, recruits very well in the public sector. A lot of graduates put it down as their first choice when they come to join the civil service. Uh, and I think we've established a reputation over the years as having one of the highest quality aid programs run by anybody. Now, in, in, the, in the closing months of uh, your uh, role as the holder of that portfolio, you negotiated uh, uh, an agreement with Brazil, which uh, has received a lot of uh, favorable press from the Times and from The Economist. Uh, tell us what uh, that negotiation was about and, and, and why it was so uh, uh, pivotal, in a way, for the, the role you've now undertaken, or, or related, uh, I should say. Uh, to, to the, the, the projects you now have to deal with? Uh, I think I'd, if I may, like to answer that question by taking a step back for a moment. I'd always been extremely concerned about the relationship between aid and development and environmental imperatives. Uh, and we had been trying to ensure for uh, some time before from the time I'd become minister about three years ago, that our own environment, uh, that our own uh, aid program was environmentally friendly. Um, now there are two particular um, things you have to do in order to ensure that that happens. The first is to build in a sense of environmental consciousness into all that you do. Uh, typically, uh, we've uh, applied cost-benefit analysis and so on to aid projects and haven't built into the system from the word go um, awareness of environmental impact. So uh, there was first of all that managerial job to accomplish. Secondly, we obviously wanted to ensure that our individual projects helped uh, conserve and preserve and improve the environment. Uh, and that meant getting involved far more in areas like tropical forestry, to take one example. And it's, a, it's an area where we have a particularly substantial amount of expertise in the United Kingdom because of our colonial past, because of our, the breadth of our colonial past. Uh, the Oxford Forestry Institute used to be called the Imperial Forestry Institute until uh, a few years ago. Uh, that's um, now been painted out above the door. Um, so that was the background. Now, we had started to look for um, individual areas where we needed to do more as an aid donor without overlooking the fact that in most developing countries it's poverty itself which is the most toxic element in the environment rather than, as is the case in the north, um, unthinking affluence and industrialization. Industrialization has an impact in the south of the globe as well, but Poverty is the main problem and uh, I feel very strongly that whatever we do, we shouldn't think um, a point made very strongly by the Brundtland report, we shouldn't think that we can help developing countries by abandoning econ economic growth. What we want is economic growth which is sustainable. I believe that in order to uh, bring developing countries along with us um, in the uh, richer part of the world, uh, it's not adequate or appropriate to hector them or lecture them or bully them. Uh, we have to have a relationship which is based on uh, equality of respect and we have to bring developing countries along with us. Now that brings us to the particular case of Brazil. Uh, there's been a lot of concern expressed about the 
destruction of the, the Amazonian rainforest, uh, and that concern is wholly understandable. Uh, about 60% of the total of tropical rainforest left in the world is in the Amazon. Uh, the Amazon itself is an almost unique hydrological uh, resource. Uh, it obviously has a tremendous impact on the local climate. There is the whole question of genetic diversity with, as you know, many of the plants uh, in the Amazon being used for medicinal purposes. They say that for a whole range of reasons, um, including carbon fixation, um, which given the amount of CO2 we push into the atmosphere in the developed world, we're particularly concerned about, uh, a whole range of reasons why one needed um, to find ways in which one could assist Brazil to manage its forest sustainably. Um, we uh, began discussions with Brazil about how we could provide technical cooperation and assistance uh, to them uh, in the Amazon. They said they had other environmental priorities as well. Uh, for example, the provision of cleaner water in some of their urban areas. So uh, we had groups of their experts coming to Britain. Uh, I went to um, Brazil in the wake of, an, of, an, of a visit by some of our experts and we found a menu of projects uh, to help them with. Um, uh, sustainable forestry management, which I've mentioned, um, providing an inventory for the genetic resources of the Amazon, work on the relationship between forest and climate, uh, and work as well um, on some of the urban problems of Sao Paulo, as well as general training. Um, I don't think that that agreement that we've signed with Brazil is going to, quote, save the Amazon. Um, I think, though, that it's a, a useful step in the right direction and provides a sort of model for the way in which developed and developing countries are going to have to cooperate on the basis, I repeat, of equality of respect rather than us in the developed world thinking that it's either right or helpful for us to try to lean on developing countries. Do you think that a, a, a middle ranked power like your country is better positioned to achieve such a result than say a superpower or a multilateral set of negotiations? I don't necessarily think so. I think whether one's a superpower or a smaller power like us you're unlikely to be able to carry conviction um, and uh, earn support in a poorer country um, if you lecture them in a way which uh, will occasionally seem to them to be both um, tiresome, a threat to their sovereignty and, dare I say, hypocritical. Um, uh, the Brazilians were uh, much concerned about two or three things which had happened uh, recently. They were concerned by uh, the uh, expressions, including some by leading European politicians, um, to the effect that the Amazon should be internationalized. Um, they thought that was a direct attack on their sovereignty. Uh, they were concerned that they'd had lectures, for example, from very well-meaning uh, American politicians about the uh, survival of uh, indigenous peoples and indigenous tribes and they took the view on balance that if they were to get lectures on the survival of tribes from anyone maybe um, American politicians weren't um, first in the in, in, in the queue. Um, they also noticed what's happening to some of the rainforest which is still in the United States in Alaska where um, there's a good deal of encouragement in their view of commercial logging so they took with a pinch of salt and um, strong words from Americans on that subject too. Now, I don't, I don't mean to isolate the United States uh, in that mm -hmm. sense. I think we are all guilty occasionally of grandstanding on environmental issues, grandstanding in a way uh, which may g gain us um, lots of uh, brownie points with a domestic audience, but makes it more difficult for us to set up uh, the sort of arrangements and the cooperation um, with poorer countries, which are essential if we're to tackle global environmental problems successfully. Uh, I think it's, it's a point which I've argued frequently, and I think when I first argued it, people thought I was rather eccentric to do so. 
that the environment is going to dominate the international agenda in the same sort of way that uh, disarmament has for the last 30 or 40 years. But it's going to be more difficult to deal with environmental issues because so many more countries are involved. Um, one's going to be constantly trying to mobilize consent across quite, quite a broad front. Uh, look at what's going to happen when we start tackling questions of energy efficiency with large poorer countries like India and China. It's going to be very difficult, very delicate work. And, and the problem there is that in, in a way we're, we're asking them to forego the route that we have taken to industrialization uh, uh, without offering the, the kind of aid or support that, that might make that possible. Uh, uh, is, is that sort of the crunch of the problem, that it, it's, it's almost a, an effort on our part they may perceive to deny them the status that they could acquire through their own? That's certainly how a lot of them see it. Yeah. Um, I think that there are, there are two problems. First of all, um, they definitely, uh, many of them, see the developed world saying to them, um, OK, we've enjoyed economic growth this way, but um, we're terribly sorry, you can't. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, we'd like to defend your inalienable right to be poor. Um, secondly, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's also of uh, some uh, relevance, um, they're very concerned about what they see as our contribution to problems environmentally. Um, undoubtedly, at the moment, the major cause of CO2 emissions is what happens in developed countries. Um, so they're very inclined to say, well, you sort out your problems, and then when we're doing um, when we're doing anything like as badly as you are, um, we'll try to sort out ours too. I, that's not a remotely adequate uh, response for them to make, but it's understandable that they should occasionally see things in that way. Uh, why were uh, you farsighted in, in seeing the environment uh, as an issue in this in this position? You 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 have described setting out to to put it on the agenda. Was it the political pressures that you were feeling from the populace, or what that uh, that generated this concern? I don't think I was particularly farsighted. I think there are an awful lot of people. Um, some who work for the environmental NGOs who've been much more far-sighted. Um, though I sometimes argue with the extent to which they think you can single issue mm -hmm. uh, the world. Uh, I, I simply myself don't believe that's possible. Just to jog back for one moment to what I was saying about the developed world, developing world relationship. Um, I do take exception to the way in which quite a lot of environmental groups um, think that we should forget all the other sorts of development assistance that we've been providing to poorer countries and just concentrate on environmental um, projects uh, and shift resources from direct poverty alleviation or primary health care or whatever uh, and spend it on direct um, uh, environmental projects and I simply don't think um, that that is the right approach. I think what we do on the environment has to be additional to what else we're doing uh, on, uh, to encourage development in poorer countries. Um, going back to whether or not I was um, perceptive, as I've said on a number of occasions, I think I was part of a generation which uh, grew up reading Schumacher and didn't therefore assume that people who argued about the environmental threat to our present and our future um, were uh, romantic um, uh, eccentrics, um, which was maybe the uh, mindset of an older political generation. Um, I think that uh, in addition, uh, you didn't have to have very substantial antennae in British or European politics to recognize mounting public concern about environmental matters. It's really the second wave we've seen in Europe as a whole. The first wave was in the early 1970s, which was interestingly the last time we had a period of economic growth. Then certainly in Britain, 
in the later 70s, we found ourselves contemplating our own naval, uh, trying to work out how we could re-establish economic growth. Uh, we're at the end of a long, steady period of economic growth now, and I think it's very understandable that people should be worried again about the environment, worried about the quality of life and not just how, how to promote economic growth. And I think that that concern is here to stay. I would make a distinction between what's happened in Germany and what's happened elsewhere in Europe, um, which I would largely relate to the greater success that the Germans have had in managing their economy. Um, they've had a much longer period of economic growth than any of the rest of us, and therefore I think that it's not surprising that uh, their greens, their um, uh, environmentally um, oriented uh, parties um, have taken root uh, for much longer and have had more of a substantial impact on public debate. Is it the problem here for a politician that, that at least some elements of the environmental movement are really challenging the, the question of, of economic growth, especially in its unbridled forms? What, what, what sort of problem does that pose for political leaders like yourself? It poses um, a problem because you find yourself having to define rather difficult and nebulous concepts like sustainable economic growth. Um, one of the first things that my um, new department will be doing is to publish um, a series of uh, studies on what exactly we mean by sustainable economic growth. Uh, because I don't think it's sufficient for us to uh, merely parrot the expression as though it was the answer to uh, critics of growth per se. Um, but beyond that, I don't believe that, one will, that I will have too much difficulty in arguing the case for economic growth, albeit sustainable economic growth, because we do in the UK um, have an example of a period when we had no economic growth. Uh, we don't have to predict what happens to the environment in those circumstances. We know uh, in the 1970s with nil economic growth what got savaged, uh, what got savaged were capital investment programs uh, to improve the quality of water, to deal with sewage treatment, um, to uh, make our energy uh, sector more efficient. Uh, money still went into subsidies uh, and uh, uh, very damaging subsidies to uh, agriculture, to energy and so on. Um, but the, the consequence then of no economic growth was a worsening in the quality of our environment. The most ravaged environment in Europe is uh, Poland, East Germany, um, Eastern Europe, where a combination of uh, public sector incompetence and nil economic growth have produced an environmental sink. Uh, and uh, I would guess that that's going to be one of the major European issues in the next uh, generation, as, which I hope is the case, Western Europe and Eastern Europe come closer together. I guess we're going to spend uh, some of our resources in Western Europe helping to clean up Eastern Europe. Now, uh, a critic of your party might, uh, or of any conservative party, might say, well, really a conservative party is, is vulnerable on these issues. It's really not positioned to, to really uh, 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 confront uh, the environmental problems we face, so long as it's committed to the marketplace, to, to unbridled capitalism, to limited regulation, and so on. What is your response to, to that argument? Uh, my response to that argument is, um, uh, just like Adam Smith, I don't think that capitalism should be unbridled, if by unbridled you mean unregulated. Um, I think a marketplace works um, effectively when it does so within, uh, within rules which both uh, guarantee its survival and health and, uh, more to the point, guarantee the survival and health of the community um, for which it's uh, working. Um, so for me there is no paradox about believing in the efficacy of market forces on the one hand and on the other. Um, believing very strongly that market forces 
should uh, obey civilized standards in relation, if you like, to accountancy practice and in relation to environmental practice. I don't regard that as, a, as, as remotely a paradox. What I think one has to do is to be clear about roles. I think that the private sector, the market, is good at producing goods uh, and providing services. I think government is good at regulating uh, and uh, controlling. Um, I think when you confuse those functions, you then run into all sorts of difficulties. We've been uh, for years confusing those functions in relation to our water industry. We're now trying to get away from that by distinguishing between um, those who are responsible for providing water and those who are responsible for regulating quality of water. And I think that um, there should not be any uh, reason at all why a vigorous market economy shouldn't uh, obey uh, precise and sensible rules which ensure that the market economy discharges its social obligations. And does that mean more regulation, more uh, taxes to direct behavior in a certain way? Uh, it certainly means uh, regulation. It certainly means obliging those who pollute to pay for it. Um, it certainly uh, does, I think, um, envisage a role for the tax system in encouraging good environmental practice and discouraging bad. Uh, one of the uh, effective ways in which we've used taxes in the last few years is to open up a differential in price between uh, unleaded petrol and ordinary petrol. Um, and I think that's a substantial reason why the number of outlets providing unleaded petrol in the UK in the last couple of years has enormously mushroomed and why the number of people like me who've converted their cars to take unleaded petrol has mushroomed at the same time. So I think you can use the tax system um, in order to encourage people to make environmentally benign choices. But on balance, um, I'm not in favor of trying to build too many um, special breaks into the tax system. Um, on balance, I'm rather more in favor of, uh, of uh, a level um, economic playing field, um, but a playing field in which the environmental warning notices are written in large green letters. Now, isn't a lot of your opposition going to come from your fellow uh, secretaries of state in other departments. Uh, is the Secretary of State for Agriculture going to uh, favor uh, necessarily limiting chemicals with regard uh, to, to the constituencies and farm and on and on? One, is, is this the case? I think that um, all um, ministers are going to have to uh, become conscious of the environmental imperatives in uh, in government um, and we've actually only recently um, made quite a lot of progress in relation to agriculture and, um, and, and nitrates um, thanks not least I suspect to the fact that our new agriculture minister was previously in the Department of the Environment which is which is a help um, but you have obviously put your finger on a central problem for any government um, there's an analogy. Our last budget minister responsible for controlling public expenditure used to make the point very frequently that he regarded himself as the taxpayer's friend. Uh, and uh, while he had to fight spending ministers in order to ensure that uh, um, the budget didn't go out of control, uh, he also had to try to encourage budget ministers to think for themselves about the importance of getting value for money and uh, not thinking that every problem uh, could be uh, answered by throwing um, cash at it. I think there is a, a comparable position for an environment minister. I think an environment minister um, has to be the, um, the friend of uh, the present and the future. Um, and I think an environment minister has to try to encourage his colleagues to think similarly. But that doesn't mean that uh, I guess I'm always going to be able to see eye to eye easily with um, energy ministers or um, conceivably even the most uh, benign agriculture ministers. 
You, in looking at your career, we've talked about uh, the importance of words in, in the jobs that you've held. Uh, and, and we've also talked about concrete uh, policies. I guess uh, I was led to conclude you were farsighted in the sense that although the environment in the development office uh, w was an issue that was known that, that it, by the end of your term you had uh, made concrete policies or negotiated concrete deals that, that, that moved the process mm -hmm. a little long. What I'm, I'm curious about is what standard would, would you suggest we apply to you as you enter this office? Uh, what, what should our expectations be about the, what the Minister of Environment uh, will accomplish over the long term? I don't necessarily mean a particular policy, but, but help us uh, understand how we should relate to politicians as they use words in this area, but but in fact we're gonna the the long term issue requires that, that we get some results. Yes, it does. Um, I think that the argument about the environment can all too easily be railroaded by the usual sort of partisan knockabout and become an argument about whether the um, correct uh, figure for this or that. Um, environmental improvement is 65 or 66 percent um, and I think the arguments can also be railroaded by those um, for whom no politician and no government minister is ever going to be able to do enough because there are people in the environmental field as in others who don't actually concede that other people ha are entitled to a point of view uh, and who don't uh, either um, uh, concede uh, that uh, there are quite a lot of things outside their own um, particular range of interests which have to be taken account of in governing a country. Uh, putting those things on one side, what I would hope um, that I would be able to do is first of all um, convince people of the sense central and integral importance of the environment in discussing um, really the whole range of political issues. Um, I hope that we can stop regarding the environment as a sort of um, optional add-on, um, like um, belief in motherhood or um, kindness to furry creatures, and, and see it as, as something which is right at the heart of political debate, rather in the way um, that at least in the late 70s and 80s we've regarded um, the tax public expenditure balance as being at the centre of um, political argument and debate rather than, rather than an optional extra. Secondly, I would very much hope that uh, Britain would be seen in the next few years as um, one of those countries which is in the van internationally in trying to move environmental consciousness globally um, on um, a few more uh, meters down the road. Um, we're pressing hard at the moment for a global climate convention, a global convention on climate change, um, which would be a sort of a good conduct guide internationally into which we could slot protocols, rather like the Montreal Protocol on uh, the ozone layer, as science, economics and uh, public will come into balance. I'd also hope that domestically um, I'd be able in the next year or so to set out a fairly clear and coherent strategic overview on the environment, of how we see the environment, um, answering questions like some of those that you've asked about the relationship between uh, between economic policies and the environment, the relationship between growth and the environment, uh, the relationship between uh, private sector companies and environmental concern, uh, all those uh, sort of things. Um, so if I can move the argument on a bit in those sort of directions, I'd reckon that I'd done a reasonably good job. Whether other people would or not is another matter because um, my department covers an awful lot of things in addition to those we've been talking about. We cover housing and planning and inner cities. Uh, we cover local government and local government finance. So there's 
um, there's plenty of uh, issues on which I can get bogged down unless I'm rather careful. Uh, one issue that, that we must touch on is this whole question of national interest and nationalism in these problems, because we are talking about global problems in many cases with, which will require global solutions. Uh, it, will, will countries have to give up some of their sovereignty to, to deal with these issues, or can they go uh, their own way and mutually cooperate with others to get the same result? Well, it, if, if you regard it as fundamental to your sovereignty um, to uh, emit um, uh, as much carbon, uh, as much CO2 into the atmosphere as you want, um, then sometime between now and the not too distant future, uh, I think you're going to have to redefine your sovereignty. Um, I find it very difficult to talk about sovereignty in the absolute. Uh, I find it easier, rather as uh, the same would be the case in talking about freedom, to talk about um, sovereignty to do this or sovereignty to do that. Um, I think that we are going to have to pool what we would classically describe as our sovereignty in many respects um, in order to deal with problems which know no frontiers. There's no east and west when it comes to the environmental challenge. There's no north and south. We're all in this together. We've used, um, it's been one of the cliches of discussion of international affairs for years. We've used the expression interdependence. Well, my heavens, the thing we really, that really does um, underline interdependence is the environment. Uh, we've, we've talked about uh, skills in, in the work that you've done and that you will do. And I, and I want to just clarify that a minute. What, uh, what, what really makes for a, an effective political leader on these types of, of issues that we've been discussing? I think that the political leader has to uh, mobilize support and consent around propositions which aren't always um, very popular. Now, you may say, but on the environment, everybody's on your side. Um, I think that's only true up to a point. Uh, people haven't really been challenged yet with the consequences of some of the um, uh, rhetorical um, objectives which they uh, say they share. Uh, if we are to be really effective in handling the environment and enhancing the quality of our environment, we're going sooner rather than later to have to start paying for it. And one of my biggest challenges, I would guess, uh, is to um, be sufficiently persuasive in discussing these issues in public um, as to make people recognize that when their um, water bills are larger or their energy bills are larger, um, that is not because of um, some uh, inadequacy of government for which populist politicians can, um, uh, can uh, uh, gain votes by denouncing it. Um, that's because those are the costs we pay for a cleaner environment. So that the, the art of political education is really uh, uh, central to be when you're on the cutting edge of, of issues like the environment. Politicians, I think, have to uh, give people tunes they can whistle. And the better sort of politician um, gives people tunes which um, have more in common with uh, uh, Mozart than uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. On that uh, note, uh, Mr. Patton, thank you very much uh, for taking the time from your busy schedule to be with us here today. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation on international affairs.
information on this series, contact the Institute of International Studies, 215 Moses Hall, UC Berkeley, Berkeley, California, 94720, or call area code 415-642-2474.